Welcome, everybody. Uh, for those uh, that are, are starting day two with us, uh, welcome. Uh, it's great to see you. you know, our campaign began yesterday. We crossed the line of departure, line of contact yesterday morning. We made contact yesterday and fought through a series of objectives. Last night, we secured our initial objective, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Ritchie and Dr. Overy last evening. It was uh, a, a huge success on the objective, and uh, there's a little chance to refit last night for some of you. Uh, and now, guess what? We're going to continue the mission today, uh, and we have an additional objectives to see. So the campaign continues. Uh, this morning, we're going to you know, kick off with what should be a, a fun and amazing panel with longtime friend of the museum, internationally acclaimed author and documentarian James Holland. James, welcome, and museum. And, and of course, uh, museum presidential counselor and award-winning military historian, Dr. Con Crane. Now, this session is uh, called Losing at War, Battlefield Blunders and the Men Who Made Them. And these two scholars will delve into a discussion of some of the military decisions during World War II that historians have typically referred to as blunders, or as Rob would do, blunders, <laughs> and the leaders who are responsible for them. So uh, our chair, though, has uh, introduced a, a, a newcomer to the Jenny Craig Institute, our own uh, military historian, Dr. John Cortola. He'll be chairing this session and providing some comments and commentary and questions for our panelists. Uh, John is a retired Marine Corps officer, 22 years. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Kansas and is a specialist, um, surprisingly for Marine, on World War II air power history and the early Cold War. So a, a pretty eclectic group here. His most recent book, Autumn of Our Discontent, was published by the Naval Institute Press in 2022. So with that, uh, we've got battle hand over to John. Great. Continue mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, as Mike pointed out, yeah, I'm a Marine officer who used to work for the Army who studies the Air Force. So I got the joint thing all pretty much covered uh, in that regard. Uh, let me introduce our panel. I'm going to start uh, to my left, your right, with uh, James Holland. He's an internationally acclaimed and award-winning historian, writer, and broadcaster. The author of a number of best-selling his stories, including Fortress Malta, An Island Under Siege, Battle of Britain, Dam Busters, and his most recent work, Brothers in Arms, is an account of a British tank regiment from D-Day to V-E Day. He has also written nine works of historical fiction, including the Jack Tanner novels. He has presented and written a large number of television programs and series, including the BBC's The Battle of Malta, and is scripted uh, and is in producing a film of his novel, A Pair of Silver Wings, largely set in Malta during the war. <laughs> he is also chair of the Chalk Valley Historical Festival, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and a research fellow at Swansea University. He's also an avid cricket player uh, and plays for both the Chalk Valley and, author, and authors cricket clubs. So please welcome uh, Dr. Holland, or Mr. Holland with us. Uh, uh, further to my left, uh, you're right, is Dr. Conrad Crane, a retired Army officer who is currently the senior research historian for Strategic Studies Institute of the Army War College. He is a 1974 graduate of West Point with a PhD from Stanford. He has written or edited on most of the American wars, including his 2016 American Air Power Strategy in World War II, Bomb Cities and Civilians in Oil. In the same year, he was awarded the Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize by the Society of Military History for his lifetime contributions in the field. He has taught history for 12 years at West Point and for 20 more at the Army War College. One of his proudest roles has been to be a longtime presidential counsel for the World War II Museum, watching it evolve into one building into the national treasure and complex that it is today. Welcome. Before I set a, a framework for our discussion here, Dr. Crane has a question he'd like to pose to the audience. Yeah, um, th this, uh, this panel is placed where it is with much malice aforethought. Uh, <laughs> we are basically, as, as you know, if, if you've read the news, that uh, the famous 
the entertainer Gallagher just passed away. In many ways, we are the Gallagher panel. We are up here, but we're going to smash historical fruit <laughs> to try to liven things up. And I have a question for the audience. How many of you were at the What If panel we did last year at the conference? Uh, we've got a realm, we'll probably delve some into the what if uh, environment in this as well. I, is the guy out there who asked the question about whether the, if the what happened if the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? <laughs> um, hey, Jeremy, make sure that the, that the microphone stays at least 20 feet away from him <laughs> for the rest of the conference. Okay, it's all yours. Okay. Just by way of, of kind of framing the discussion here, because we're going to go all over the place, but uh, I, before we started uh, this uh, panel, I looked up the actual definition of a blunder. It's both a noun and a verb, and it's generally referred to in Merriam-Webster as a gross error or mistake resulting usually from stupidity, ignorance, or carelessness. Now, with that as a definition, I, I'm going to pose to, to our gentleman here, you know, when we look at these blunders, were the decisions made by these commanders reasonable given their knowledge, training, and experience at that particular stage of the war? And furthermore, since war is often defined by having three levels, strategic, operational, and tactical, should these blunders be viewed with this construct in mind? And if so, can we identify Axis or Allied blunders at various levers, levels and their proportionate results? So with that framework, I will turn the floor over to uh, our panel who can jump right in and go to their first blunder. Well, I mean, you know, when you're looking at the Second World War, there's so many blunders, it's kind of, where do you, where do you start? I mean, I, you know, when I first thought about this, I was thinking, well, you know, Park Marco Polo Bridge incident um, in 1937, you know, then Colonel uh, Mutaguchi oh, Renya. Um, you know, you could say that was a little bit of an overreaction, um, and, and you could say that that was pretty careless because it ended up with um, Japan invading China. It didn't go very well. It ended up being more of a hindrance than a help to their uh, burgeoning... Uh, growing urban population and lack of resources, which then directly led to Pearl Harbor, and that didn't work out very well um, for anyone, but at least not the Japanese. Then I was sort of thinking, well, you know, 1st of September 1939, um, Hitler invading Poland, that was pretty careless. It didn't work out very well in the long run either. Um, so I think that's a pretty big blunder, possibly the biggest blunder of them all. Um, and then you sort of keep going, and you kind of think, well, you know, Red Army going into Poland, I mean, Finland rather, at the um, end of November 1939, that wasn't great. Um, then you think of kind of, I don't know, um, sort of lack of decision from the Allies about Norway and kind of, you know, thinking about it in September 1939, not actually doing something till April, by which time it was all kind of too late. That was careless, I would say, um, and, a, and a pretty big blunder. Then you've got kind of lack of defenses by the French at Sedan, exactly the same place where the Germans crossed, well, the Prussians crossed in 1870 and the Germans crossed in 1914, and they do it again on the kind of 13th of May 1940. That was pretty careless, and I think you'd call that a pretty big blunder. Then you go to the kind of, you know, the halt order, um, the Hitler's infamous halt order of the uh, 24th of May, just when he's got the, uh, got the British and French exactly where he wants them. And, you know, and I think you can argue and argue pretty convincingly that the closest Britain comes to losing the war is Monday, the 27th of May, which is the time when Halifax, who is the most respected politician in the entire country in Britain at the time, is threatened to resign, leave the cabinet, which would have almost certainly brought down the government. And had, at that point, BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, been completely surrounded, as it would have been almost certainly had the halt order not been imposed, then you can see that all kind of, you know, the whole edifice coming down and Britain kind of suing for peace in, in very quick order. So that's a pretty big, big blunder too. Um, but, you know, we're only at kind of May 1940. Um, uh, and we've got a long way to go. Uh, and I'm sort of conscious that I'm sounding just a kind of, you know, a teeny bit glib here. And I know, Con, you had a, ha you wanted a kind of a slightly more um, um, forensic way of looking at it, didn't you? Yeah, uh, so many blunders, so little time. <laughs> uh, no, I, I tried to, <coughs> I, basically, these are generally not stupid people making these decisions. Uh, I, I, was, I think we could argue, and we probably will talk about how ideology drives some stupidity here and there, but, you know, I, so I was trying to look at these things a little bit different and try to not provide excuses, but I guess explanations for some of these things. Like sometimes it's a, the right decision, but at the wrong time. Uh, a good example would be MacArthur in the Philippines, who realizes very early on that there's no way he's going to be relieved if the Japanese invade, so we're going into Bataan is a bad idea. He's got to defeat the Japanese on the beaches, so he decides to reorganize the Philippine army, takes 10 good regiments, turns them into 10 bad divisions, abandons the plans to go into Bataan, 
problem is he makes that decision too late. You know, de de defeating the Japanese on a beach is probably the right idea, but by the time that he starts to exercise his, his, his plans, the Japanese invade, and so he's caught with an unprepared Philippine army. Bataan's not prepared either. He ends up with more people there than he expected in a place that's unprepared for siege. Again, probably right decision, but wrong time. Another example in the naval realm would be, let's look at Spruance and Halsey uh, in Basel, Philippine Sea and Lady Gulf. You know, that uh, we, we uh, you know, Halsey gets massive criticism for abandoning the, to go chase the Japanese characters at Lady Gulf and allows Korea to come in and almost destroy the fleet. Another blunder, Korea turning around. Though I, I gotta say that I, I appreciate what Korea did because the Battle of Lady Gulf is my favorite American battle of all time because there's so many great American one-liners that come out of the battle. <laughs> we, get, we get into that question and answer if you want to. But, uh, but again, if you flip-flop Palsy and Spruance, Spruance gets criticized in the Philippine Sea because he doesn't chase after the Japanese carriers and lets them get away. If you put Halsey at the Philippine Sea, remember he and Spruance are off alternating command. If Halsey is the Philippine Sea, the Japanese carriers don't get away. There is no uh, diversion at Lady Gulf. If Spruance is at Lady Gulf, he's not gonna go chase the carriers. He's gonna stay back and guard the fleet. So again, the decisions they made in those two battles would have been the correct ones in the other battle that they weren't at. Um, Another one would be, and, and John, right, when he talks about the different levels of war, uh, talk about somebody, you know, Erwin Rommel, North Africa, and I know that James has strong feelings on some I've of I've got quite well. strong feelings about Spruance as well, actually. Good. Well, I'll, 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 let me prime the pump a little bit for, for James. The uh, Rommel, North Africa, tactically and operationally, what he does is arguably okay, but the problem at the strategic level, that is a disastrous campaign for the Axis. There's no, it, it's been another case of theateritis where an individual doesn't appreciate kind of strategic impacts, the Italians can't provide it, he's too ambitious what he tries to do, Commando Supremo gets, gets uh, overwhelmed by it. Part of it's because of what's, of the distance of Malta and what Malta does for supply lines across the Mediterranean, but again, it's, it's a theater commander doesn't realize this, the strategic impacts of what he's doing. Uh, another set that I'll throw out for initial thoughts um, deals with uh, uh, resource decisions. Um, people not appreciating the reason, again, the decisions they make, that they have, there's, that there's a certain sense behind it, but they don't understand the resource decisions. I think that the whole air campaign in 1943 is a blunder. The Americans are suffering 75% casualties. Bomber Harris destroys the front line of Bomber Command and the operations against Berlin at the end of 43. I, I think the whole air campaign in 1943 is a blunder. Um, again, we can talk about that, but I think there would have been a lot less casualty prone ways to, to do some of the things that they are doing. I've got to say, Con, you know, that's going to keep us going for 61 minutes. No Good. Right. Good. <laughs> and another one is, if one of the things that always strikes me, and we'll talk about some of this, is this whole idea of how alliances work together. It struck me how much of Lend-Lease to Russia goes right by Japan on the way to Vladivostok, and the Japanese never interfere with it at all. And it just it boggles the mind. Again, this is an alliance that isn't compared to one that is. So these are just some other ideas. You know, the other, another one would be that the uh, failure to prepare for catastrophic success. Um, I throw that out. If you think about the Allied breakout from Normandy, that at D plus 90, the, the, the Allied forces are at the line that they initially projected for D plus 365. And the logistics are just not prepared to deal with that and you end up with the running out of fuel and all of the, the hard resource decisions uh, that you know, Patton drives Patton crazy. And also the, the rest of the, the Shafe staff, since he's stealing all the supplies, they're supposed to be going to other armies. Uh, but again, it's because they didn't, they didn't plan for catastrophic success. So is, is it a blunder or is it just, you know, the fact that war tends to go directions we, we don't expect them to? I'll throw, so I'll throw that out as some extra, extra ideas. If I could, uh, Where do we want to start? <laughs> I mean... Let, let, I'm going to try. Okay. Uh, both, with riffs on both what you just said, we're talking about 1940 and making the right decision at the wrong time or vice versa. I'm gonna throw out France in 1940 and the doctrine that they follow as a result of the First World War. Oh Firepower kills, yes. uh, method uh, methodical warfare is the future, and that is their 
basic doctrine with the Maginot Line and those kinds of things and penny packeting their, their armor assets. So they have a doctrinal blunder on the front end as a result of their experiences from the First World War. But they're also, you got to understand also the French, and there's a good book by Jenny Kiesling and also Bob Doty's written some stuff too. And the French, the French end up with the strategy they can afford. Yes. Not the one that they need. Yes, there's they an economic end, piece to this. There's an economic piece, and that's another, they knew they needed more, but they couldn't afford it. So, I mean, when we're, well, you know, when you're looking at 1940, it's just one of enormous frustration. Um, anyone who's been to Sedan, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago, if you go there, you see all these kind of these the, these bunkers, these casements, all around, looking over overlooking the uh, the river, um, the, um, over the Meuse, and you just sit there, and you just feel really frustrated because it all could have been avoided. I mean, you know, had the, you know there was sort of tail to bumper traffic in the Ardennes as as the uh, as von Kleist. Uh, um, Panzer Group were coming through, and um, you know it was literally the biggest amount of gridlock you ever see. And then suddenly the infantry divisions don't really buy into the whole kind of armored thrust idea anyway. They start coming, cutting in on it, and you haven't got enough roads, and it's just total, total mayhem. And various reconnaissance planes go over and go, my God, you know that's a whole German army down there in these woods. You know we've got a fantastic opportunity to bomb them. And the French go, no, can't be possible. Can't be true. You must have um, uh, must have misseen it. Uh, that that didn't really happen, and so they don't go and bomb it. You know, I mean, it would have been so easy. And the interesting thing about the French is is, is that they're kind of they've got it wrong on a kind of strategic level, on an operational level, and on a tactical level. Uh, and one of the things that I think is so fascinating about it is is that they think the war is going to be long, attritional, drawn out, but static. And kind of most of that is correct, apart from the static bit, and even in. You know, actually, quite a lot of static. There is quite a lot of static mix in, in, in World War II, as it turns out. But but it isn't. It's a it's a war of maneuver. That's the bit they've got fundamentally wrong. And it's really interesting that that uh, General uh, Gamelin, who's headquarters at Chateau de Vincennes, sort of um, part of just on the edge of Paris. You know, he doesn't have a single radio in the whole headquarters. <laughs> you know, they're dependent on on good old fashioned uh, um, telegraph poles and, and and wire and traditional telephone lines. And of course, what happens is, you know, the Stukas come in, get the telephone lines, and then there's kind of lots of refugees, and the roads get clogged, and no one can move. Um, and, and so the, you send out a dispatch rider, and the dispatch rider doesn't reappear at midday. So they think, okay, I wonder what's happened to, you know, Jean Pierre. Um, and Jean Pierre hasn't come back, so they send out, you know, Claude, um, and, and he disappears, and eventually he comes back at kind of nine o'clock. And then you've got to repeat that from, from kind of overall headquarters to army group to army, to corps, to division, to brigade, to battalion. And of course, the long, long shot of all this is nothing happens. They're just absolutely stuck. Um, uh, so there's that whole problem of just lack of, of being incredibly top heavy, um, stifling initiative in lower ranks, uh, and unable to communicate properly. And the communication thing is really, really key. And it's really interesting that the, the, the Germans, of course, you can criticize them in, in many ways, and you, you can certainly criticize Hitler's invasion of Poland on the 1st of September 1939 as the start of a 10. But, but one thing they were really, really good at was comms. Um, and they were really, really good at propaganda. And what they realized in the 1930s is that what you want is you want to be able to send the same message out over and over, repeat, repeat, repeat. And what they do is they develop a thing called the Deutsche Kleinempfänger, which is the German little radio. Uh, and you can still get, you can buy these on kind of eBay or something. They're Bakelite and they're kind of nine inches by four inches by nine inches. And, um, and, and, and it's just fascinating because they're really cheap. Because in the early 1930s, a radio set was a kind of aspirational thing and it was sort of made of sort of walnut veneer and all that kind of stuff. And you know, you had to be kind of at least middle class to own one. What the Germans do is they go, everyone can have one. Uh, and they repeat the same old, old garbage. And it's not just sort of Hitler's throwing spittle and bad breath at everybody. Uh, it, it's also kind of, you know, it is marching bands. There's even some humor there as well. Yeah, there really is. And, uh, and, and the, the thing is, the army then go, hang on a minute, this is cool. You know, we've got this, this really small radio. But what about if we put our radio in our, our command car and, and then we can put it in our Panzer and, you know, we've got all those really cool BMWs with sidecars. Um, uh, motorbikes, we can put one even in there. And then the infantry and the artillery and the panzers and the reconnaissance troops, they can all communicate with one another. How neat is that? And they go, Bonza, let's go. Uh, and, and of course, the, the French and the British and the Dutch and the Belgians don't have anything like this. And so what they're able to, the Germans are able to do is concentrate their force, the Schwerpunkt, smash them, uh, and take out the French in penny packets. And that's all because it's not one of, of finances and economy. It's because the French have totally misappreciated what this future war is going to be. And they've got their old and crusty uh, um, generals who are kind of, you know, a decade and a half older than, than all the senior um, German, um, most of the senior German generals. 
and they're just too stymied in the past, and their heart's not in it, and, and, and it all goes horribly wrong. And the frustrating thing about it is it needn't have gone wrong. You know, had they gone into the Tsar in, you know, the autumn of 1939 with a little bit more gumption, <laughs> it might have been a very, very different story. But that, that highlights, I think, one aspect that, talking about the Germans being clogged up in the Ardennes, a lot of this, these battlefield blunders, I mean, think about it historically. If, well, yes, because that's a blunder that they get away with. But, yeah, but, but it, because the other side makes a bigger blunder. I mean, right. a, lot of this is, is, a lot of this is about taking risk and getting away with it. I mean, MacArthur gets away with a lot of that in the Pacific as well. He takes mm -hmm. some very risky operation in New Guinea that the Japanese are getting ready to exploit, and then, then Nimitz does something that distracts the Japanese away, and he gets away with it. Um, so a lot of it is, is, is it, it's how much risk do you take and whether you get away with it or not determines whether the damn historians are going to call it a blunder or not. <laughs> I mean, there's a great uh, Bruce Hopper, who was the uh, historian for the U.S. Strategic Air Forces, was very frustrated dealing with the airmen trying to tell the story of the war. And he had a very prescient comment where he said that, that historians were wrong to think they could control the narrative of the war while it was going on. But he said, you military guys are wrong if you think you'll be able to control a narrative after it's over. Mm. And so in the, in the end, historians are always going to win. Speaking of the economic piece that you brought up, Con, let's, let's uh, shift gear uh, to the Eastern Front and talk about Barbarossa. Yeah. And the fact that Hitler builds an army that can go to Paris or builds an army that can go to uh, Poland, but he can't build an army that goes all the way to Moscow. As a former logistician in a previous life, that frontage is basically from Kansas City to the East Coast, from Maine to Florida. And you have only about 20% of the German army mecked or armored up, and you're going to take on that whole frontage. And you haven't even mobilized the nation in terms of production and economic uh, uh, production by that time yet. Uh, and so you have a strategic blunder again, not only on the military side, but as you mentioned, the economic considerations. Well, you've, you've also got a, a, an operational blunder. I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's David Stahl, who I'm sure has been here in the past. In fact, actually, I think I met him here, here an Australian um, historian. He's, he's doing really, really fantastic work on, on the Eastern Front at the moment, and particularly the Barbarossa campaign, all the way through, actually, to the encirclement of, um, of Kiev in um, September 1941. And he's just completely rewriting all this stuff by, by having forensically gone into the kind of the, the German archives and looked at it all. And it's, it's amazing that but when, when Smolensk falls on whatever it is, 15th of July, I think it is, 1941, you know, one of those leading panzer divisions, uh, I think it's 16 panzer, is down to something like 18 tanks left, you know, just by the 16th of July. And what you see is you see this incredible, fast uh, uh, advance sort of swallowing up vast armies of, of, of the Red Army. Um, but actually, for then, then until kind of beginning of September, the, the front only moves forward about another 100 yards. So this, this sort of great surge of, 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 of movement in the opening weeks of Barbarossa from the middle of July, you know, for the next sort of six weeks or so, actually doesn't really move at all. You know, 100 miles when you're talking about the Soviet Union is, is diddly squat, frankly. So much of the Germans is front loaded to these panzer groups and, and, and they're ever, you know, all their energy, all their fighting, fighting, um, edge all goes down into these. And the problem is, is you're getting attrited all the time, even when, when you're winning. Um, and you're getting attrited in, in a number of ways. You're getting attrited in tanks getting knocked down, men being killed, and so on, and wounded. But you're also getting attrited in just, you know, the wheels literally coming off because your supply lines are so long. And that's what's called the culmination point, the point where you can no longer operate in the way you want to operate because your supply lines, your logistic lines are, are too long. Uh, and it doesn't actually take a rocket scientist to work out, or a great strategist, or, or von Clausewitz, or whatever, to tell you before Barbarossa happens that it's extremely unlikely that the entire Red Army is going to be completely defeated and the whole of the Soviet Union will collapse within 350 miles of your start point in what was Poland. Um, but at that point in the war, they're already in a real big problem because they haven't got enough of anything. They haven't got access to the world's oceans. They haven't got any you know, merchant fleet worth talking about. Um, they can't get into the oceans anyway. Um, they haven't got enough natural resources. Um, they need to go and get it from somewhere else. And the only options that are left to Hitler, I would say, by the spring of 1941, are either to make peace, uh, which he's not going to do, or go into the Soviet Union and, and uh, you know, roll the dice. But the rolling of the dice is based on the principles of of the success the previous year. And of course, France is a very, very different place. It's kind of, you know, 250 miles from one side to the other, not, not 
thousands. Uh, um, the logistics are, are nothing like as, as bad. And of course, you know, it, you've got much greater infrastructure in France. You've actually got, you know, um, France is the most automotive uh, nation in Europe at the time and second in the world only to the USA. So actually there's lots of petrol stations and lots of spare parts. And you know, if your Panzer runs out, you can go into the forecourt and say, you know, fill her up please, Jean Johnny Lair. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and off you go again. Well, you can't do that in the Russian steppes, let me tell you. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem. And so. What you then see in the rhetoric of the German commanders is lots of stuff about we will will it, you know, the will of the German people will get us, you know, the German army will get us free, but that's just, I mean, that's just absolute tosh. I mean, I mean you can't just will it, you know, I, I can't sort of go to the moon just because I want to, uh, um, because I will it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely absurd. Yeah, that, there's that, that great quote that uh, amateurs study tactics, but professionals study logistics. Mm. And, and that's a lot of the theme. I'll just throw out one other example, and then we'll move on to some other things. But again, going back to the air war in 43, Hap Arnold drives Ira Aker nuts because <laughs> he's trying to push, uh, talk about being front loaded. He does the same thing to Aker. He sends all the, the bomber groups and he sends the bomber crews. What he doesn't send is spare parts and maintenance people. So Aker ends up with all this front loaded organization, but he can't maintain it. And you know, operational rates are low, and, and, and you can't replace your. I mean, it, it causes them all kinds of problems. But even at the, you know, in, in the, it, this is Hap Arnold in Washington isn't thinking about the logistics requirements of managing the air war in 1943. So it's a, it's a problem that happens on both sides with the lack of appreciation of the logistic requirements for the, for the operations that they design. And to that point, you think about when the Germans go into Russia, they're taking a lot of captured French vehicles with them as part of their mobile movement. And if you're looking for the parts for a 37 Peugeot when you're in the steppes of, of Russia, good luck. You know? um, but let's shift gears now. At the break, we were talking a little bit about sea lines of communication and their importance in the Pacific War. Um, and the fact that you know, the Japanese, obviously living on an island nation, have a problem with natural resources and the ability to get those things from Java or their captured territories back to the home the homelands, and so they have a strategic uh, resourcing problem already. Uh, and we were having this discussion uh, regarding the Pacific campaign, and I'll, I'll turn it over to George. Well, I mean, the, the really interesting thing about that is, of course, you know, one of the reasons you're going into what is now Vietnam or um, you know, what Indochina as it then was, or Burma or all the places, so that you can get your rubber, so you can get your oil that you don't have, um, so you can get these these precious resources. What's really interesting is they then don't have the capacity to then move it. So you know, the British set fire to the to, to, to a lot of the oil oil fields in, in Burma anyway as they're retreating, but even those that are recovered, you know, the the, the Japanese don't have any means of actually transporting this oil and refining it and getting it back to back to home base so what was the point point? and you know suddenly it's you know it, it, it is incredible and you say exactly the same with the Germans in 1942 when they're going towards um, the Caucasus you know the whole point of case blue the sort of the main um, offensive of the summer of 1942 is to drive into the Caucasus and obviously as as I'm sure you will know it got derailed by um, uh, uh, the site tracking uh, Stalingrad but 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 even if they'd got to Baku, for example, what are they going to do when they get there? Because they don't have the rail capacity anymore. The Reichsbahn is absolutely the glue that is keeping the whole show on the road. And they just don't have enough capacity on the railway to get that oil back to Germany. There's no pipelines in those days. The only pipelines are going backwards to the, to the Urals, and there's not very many of them. And you know, they don't have any means of refining it. They don't have any ships. I mean, oil goes around the world in the 1940s by ship, uh, and the Germans don't really have any. So, so that's not going to work. And it's exactly the same with Rommel's drive to the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East is, is not the kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of well um, of oil that it, that's become post-war. Um, the number one oil producer in the world in, in the 1940s is the USA, and the second is, is, is the Dutch East Indies, Venezuela. Um, and, and Baku is kind of third, and quite a long way third as it happens. But, but the Germans, you know, if the Rommel gets to the Middle East, again, you've got the same problem. I mean, how is he going to get this oil from the Middle East back to, back to Germany? The, and the truth is, he's not. So the whole thing is kind of fatally flawed in the first place, and it's exactly the same with the Japanese. It's, it's, it's the, the, the carelessness to go back to your definition, of, of their logistics in the Second World War is just boggling. It, you know, and it really, really does make the, 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 the logistical blunders that the Allies make, and of course there's lots of them, you know, they're, they're such small bit by comparison. And you think about, too, uh, back on the Eastern Front for a second, the Russians take, what, 1.5 million rail cars and move them to the east so the Germans don't get them? Yes. And they tear up all those railroads that they do have, so the Germans have to repair those. And well, and they've got a different, they've got a different, different rail gauge. gauge and everything. And then the Rasputitsa comes, and you have you know, those problems, too. You know? 
comments? No, it, it's, it's, again, it, it, it's, there are, you know, there's a lot of factors obviously that play into this. And, and we, we talked a bit about Rommel. Um, you know, another one of those campaigns that gets extended too far, and, and I think, if you go back to Mataguchi Reign again, you know, talk about, if you, if you look in a, in a dictionary uh, for the, the definition of loose cannon, <laughs> there's a picture of Mataguchi Reina there. Uh, you know, he kicks off, he, he causes the Marco Polo Bridge incident. Well, in 1944, he's commander of a Japanese army in Burma, and he decides to invade India. And uh, everybody tells him, not a good idea, but again, the, the, we, we were talking a little bit, the, the, the Japanese command structure is bizarre. There is no joint command structure. I mean, the, the army and the navy don't talk to each other. The only person that can really make them talk is the emperor, and he doesn't get involved. So the, the, it's really a bizarre structure, and, and nobody can really tell Mataguchi Reina not to go, and he does. And we, James, I know, has written a lot on Burma, and I'm sure I want to talk about it, but that turns out a disastrous campaign. He ends up getting his army destroyed. I Come, mean, destroyed. Right. I mean, just gone. Completely All destroyed. The army is completely destroyed. So. But, but again, it's funny. He, everybody tells him not to do it. He does it anyway. And I know James gives some more details on the campaign. It's one that we don't talk a lot about, but it's, it's a disastrous campaign. It's a, but there's some fantastic fighting at Kohima, at Kohima in fall as well, some heroic mm -hmm. combat uh, in a theater that we don't pay a lot of attention to. And well, see, yeah, it's, it's, it's a call. Yes, I was just saying, and you see Mataguchi doing one of the classic blunders to quote the Princess Bride, never get involved in a land war in Asia, you know? And so there, there's that. <laughs> There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of wise, uh, wise, um, wise words in the Princess Bride, it has to be said. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, Mataguchi Renia's uh, thinking behind it is, is that, that actually, you know, what's supplying the, the Chinese, what's keeping them going is, is, this is his theory, by the way, is, is American, predominantly American supplies going over the hump, going over the Himalayas. Uh, and those, those airfields are all in Assam. So if you can get to Assam, um, and you can cause sort of insurrection in, in Bengal, which is kind of pretty, pretty against the British anyway. Uh, and as, uh, uh, and, and the mood, you know, moods are, are, are sort of pretty rebellious anyway after the kind of the global, the, after the terrible famine that happened the previous year, back end of 1942 into 1943. Um, then maybe you could sort of foment a, a wider insurrection in the, in the British Raj in India, and, and that would cause India to collapse. Then you could overrun the, uh, overrun the um, Allied air bases in, in Assam. Uh, and, you know, that would change the situation in China, um, which would then turn the tide of the war. I mean, it's quite a lot of ifs and buts to kind of to, to work in his favor, it has to be said. And yet all he's got to do really is get out of the hills and get up to Dimapur, which is right on the edge of the Brahmaputra River. And, and that is then your gateway up into, into Assam. And it's very interesting because that, that whole area around um, the border of uh, northern part of Burma and into, into what is now Manipur State and Nagaland in northeast India is really, really hilly and it's, and it's really difficult to get around. So it's, it's getting into that kind of flat plain area of, of, of Assam beyond the Brahmaputra, that's the key. And the interesting thing is, that actually, they get very, very close to doing that. And the only thing that stops them, which is, um, stops them taking Kohima, which would then, it's only about kind of 30 miles from Dimapur, which then would open that road to Dimapur and then beyond to the Brahmaputra and the plains of Assam. The only thing that stops them is these two little sideshows at a place called Jessamai um, and, and at Sangshak which are two completely forgotten battles, which no one ever remembers at all, even if they remember anything about Kohima and, and the Battle of Imphal. Uh, um, but what happens is, as they're advancing towards Kohima, they get sidetracked by these two little outposts at Jessamai, which is this tiny little kind of hill village, and, and, and Sangshat, which is exactly the same. And it holds up the Japanese advance by the best part of a week, and, and, and attrits them as well at the same time. So that by the time they get to, to, to Kohima, the British have got just enough troops to hold on, and the reinforcements arrive just at the point where the British are breaking. But had they not had that extra week in which to kind of prepare things at Kohima, Kohima would almost certainly been overrun, then Dimapur would have almost certainly been overrun, and then it's kind of anyone's guess what might have happened. So actually, the biggest blunder of all, you could argue, is stopping and getting sidetracked at these tiny little villages of Jessamai and, and, and Sangshak, um, rather than the whole, the big picture idea of sort of getting to Dimapur and beyond, beyond to Assam. I mean, obviously, inevitably, it would, have, it would have run out of steam anyway, so it was a kind of hopeless cause. But um, it didn't seem that way to Slim and, and uh, his generals on the ground and um, Montague Stockford and all the rest of it, who were the British commanders at the time. It, it looked like a really, really seriously perilous situation, and the whole thing was touch and go.
No, and, and it, so it's not one of these examples where it's, what makes it a blunder is very, I mean, it's a fine, a very fine line. It, you know, it, it doesn't get this, you know, it may, may have turned out to be a, at least a moderate Japanese victory instead of a massive defeat with just that one little change in history. There, there's a great T.X. Hamas quote that I use sometimes that said, there's a very fine line between a vision and an hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of these, you know, some of these visions almost come true. And, and you didn't, didn't know it was a hallucination until all the historians got together later or else because of little things like this little sidetrack, I can't even pronounce the name of the village, uh, it, it turns these, these mistakes into massive blunders. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you know, it, it is so fascinating. And, and you know, it, it absolutely does for, for Madaguchi Renya. And finally, his military career is over. And frankly, that's a blessing for everyone, including the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were also having a discussion during the break about command and control and the fact that the Allies, the Americans in the UK and the Russians, we get together, we, we plan strategically, don't always agree and have lots of intramural food fights between the various staffs over the next steps. But the Axis doesn't have that kind of a structure. You don't see the Japanese talking to the Germans in terms of grand strategy. And even within Japanese themselves, the Imperial Japanese Army isn't talking to the Japanese Navy. You know, and so the, their ability to effectively communicate and make strategy is hamstrung by the fact that they won't talk to each other. Um, and, I, and I think that's a, an interesting uh, blunder on the part of them on the strategic level, where the Allies actually figure this out relatively early on in the war. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And again, when you look at the, the Germans and how they treat their own allies, it's yeah. just, a, it, you know, it, it, it is absolutely appalling. I mean, there, there's been so much um, sort of ink um, spilled on you know, Anglophobia on the part of American commanders and all, and, and vice versa. And I think, personally, I kind of think it's incredibly overblown. I think, you know, if you think about the huge responsibilities on the shoulders of these men, of course, you're going to get a bit tetchy at times and, and you know, you're going to have arguments. I mean, what I think is amazing is that the Allies aren't actually allies at all. They're coalition partners. There's no formal alliance. And actually, it's how well they all get on. Um, you know, and obviously, everyone has, has brilliant people like Eisenhower and, and, and Phil Marshall Alexander, to name a couple, you know, who, who are kind of holding the whole thing together, and also the, the combined chiefs of staff, who, who, who do incredibly well to kind of um, uh, keep, keep the show on the road and, and keep a kind of, you know, a happy, happy line. Um, obviously, there's disagreements. Of course, there are. There's cultural differences. There's, there's, there's overall strategic differences. But what's amazing about it is just how well it works overall. You would have to say so. And you think about the complexities of the kind of warfare that the Allies are trying to do, the Western Allies, that is, you know, which, which is air, land, and sea. You know, everything they're doing is amphibious. And you think about the complexities of global shipping in the 1940s, which are just mind-boggling. I mean, really, truly, truly mind-boggling. And you think about how much that's all coming into play. And you think about all those young men's lives that people have got responsibility for. It is incredible how well they do. And then, you know, you look at the Germans. You know, I remember when I was um, doing some work on the Sicilian campaign, you know, and you can see these transcripts of, of sort of Hitler conference, Fuhrer conferences. And, and the kind of language they're using to describe their, uh, their Italian allies is absolutely extraordinary. Well, you know, I knew they were all kind of just sort of feckless dogs and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I've never liked the Italians. They're all a bunch of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and you kind of think, really? You know, you're talking about your allies here. You know, OK, the relationship might have been kind of going downhill a little bit by this stage. But, but even so, it's, it's, it's incredible. And then you find that, you know, the, the Reggio Aero Nautica and the, the, the Italian Air Force on Sicily and, and the Luftwaffe on Sicily, they're not talking to each other at all. I mean, there's just no joined up thinking whatsoever. It's absolutely incredible. And, and you know, this is the same with the Japanese Navy and Army. They're just, they're just not thinking on the, you know, they're not talking the same talk. But you go back to the initial discussion John had about the different levels of war, it, it always strikes me that Ike was awful at tactics. You look at Ike's performance in North Africa, was terrible at tactical level. His, his, you know, he's the land forces commander after Normandy, and he makes a number of mistakes that contribute to some of the problems, the breakout. But he's a master at the other, the higher levels of war. And at the same time, you find the other thing: you find a number of people in the war who are brilliant tactically, and then they, you know, there's the old Peter principle. Eventually, they get promoted to a level where they become incompetent. I mean, they don't, they can't handle the. The higher levels. I mean, Ike is unusual. Where he's again, he's he, he's not good at the lower levels, but people still promote him, and he ends up the master of coalition warfare that he becomes. But it's 
You know, I'd argue that in today's Army especially that he never would have made, made it past lieutenant colonel. Mm. That if you, can't, if you can't perform at the tactical level, you're not going to get promoted. I know that that's the way it is in the Army. And, and it's, but here, again, and it, it, there are diff people, different, the different levels of skills at, at, at different, you know, I, I, again, we go back to the Rommel discussion. I don't think Rommel had the strategic uh, sense that, that he needed. Um, but he, 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 obviously, tactically, he was brilliant. But that didn't translate to the success at the highest levels. Yeah, I don't think he understands the operational level either, really. Not really. I think he's, you know, he's, he's so imbued with this kind of sort of just dash forward and don't worry about your flanks. And, you know, this goes back to 1917 and his winning his, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Um, his, his blue max or whatever. Uh, um, <laughs> but, but, but he just doesn't get it. And, you know, when he, get, when he gets sent out in February 1941 out to, to, to Libya, he's told, whatever you do, don't go past, past sort of El Aguila. Um, go and start, stop there. Just make sure that, you know, put some backbone into the Italians. Make sure the British don't get to Tripoli. That's all you've got to do. And he goes, roger that. Gets over there, charges off across Cyrenaica, um, and, and runs out of steam and gets pushed back. And, you know, and so you have this kind of sort of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, um, um, Castlering is all for kind of subduing Malta. Um, they can't do both because they just don't have enough. So, you, you know, you need, you need air power to support your land campaign by the stage and, well, from the very start of the war, of course. And, and they can't have both, so they take all the Luftwaffe out of, out, of the, um, out of Malta, just at the point where they've actually done quite a lot of damage to the island uh, and neutralized it a little bit, but they completely take their foot off the gas. Malta kind of recovers very, very quickly. And takes all this, the Luftwaffe over, but there's no joined up thinking again. He doesn't get on with von Valder, who's the, uh, the commander in, um, of the Luftwaffe over there at all. They're not, they're not, again, they're not speaking the same language. Charges off, and, um, you know, had they subdued Malta properly, then that would have made, that, that would have enhanced their ability to supply North Africa much more uh, effectively than they actually did, and that was a big problem because, of course, you know, the Italians don't have many ships. They're stuck in the Mediterranean. They don't have access to the world's oceans either. They don't have a shipbuilding ca capacity, really, and certainly not once the war starts. So once you start sinking ships, and the, obviously the bigger ones get sunk first, you, you know, it's just going downhill all the time. So having an entire operation in North Africa is not a good idea for the Germans and the, and, and the Italians because they can't sustain it. They just don't have the, you know, they don't have the logistics to, to do that. But what does Rommel do in the end of May 1941, um, 42 rather, you know, not just happy enough to get, get to Brook, he then charges off into Egypt. You know, his supply lines get ever longer. They're using half their fuel just getting the fuel to the front, uh, which is not an efficient way of doing things. Uh, and lo and behold, they get absolutely smashed and destroyed, and you know it ends up with the great, great Allied victory in Tunisia in, in May 1943. And, and, and you know you're thinking, it's just insane. And, and then Hitler then reinforces Tunisia and, uh, massively in the winter of 1943, uh, 42 rather, in the beginning of 1943. I mean, to a really, really huge extent. And it's not just manpower; it's also with material, Tiger tanks, precious new Tiger tanks. Aircraft. I mean, something like 2,600 um, Luftwaffe aircraft get destroyed between November 1942 and May 1943. 2,600. I mean, that, that is a gargantuan number. And another 3,500 by, by, um, by the fall that year. You know, so that's 7,000, isn't it? No, 6,000 6, 6, aircraft destroyed in the Mediterranean at that time. I mean, that is just such an astonishing number. And these are mainly frontline aircraft. This is, this, this is you know, um, supply aircraft, fighter planes, Junkers 88 bombers, Stukas, uh, uh, and so on. You know, it's your, again, it's, your, it's, your, it's the steel of your spear that's, that's been destroyed. 500 ships get destroyed in that time. I mean, th these are numbers that they just can't sustain. Wouldn't it have been better? Once, once, I mean, just not to get involved in North Africa in the first place, but if you are involved in North Africa, is to bug out after Alamein and reinforce Sicily and Greece and, and, and Sardinia and make it really, really difficult because doing a, a, an invasion, an amphibious operation across the Mediterranean is incredibly difficult, incredibly complex. And that would have made, you know, I mean, by the time the Allies do get to Sicily, there's just two German divisions on the island. That's it. And, you know, it's a cakewalk comparatively, and 38 days later, it's all over. And, you know, um, and, and the Allies have got a toehold in Europe. I mean, again, just look at the ripple effect. The ripple effect of Rommel's decision to go past El Aguila <laughs> ends up costing 6,000 aircraft, 500 ships, hundreds... 6,000 aircraft just between, in one year, between November 1942 more, more than and that. It costs hundreds yeah. of thousands of prisoners, hundreds of thousands of casualties, and it gives the rookie Americans a theater to learn how to fight war. Mm -hmm. 
all because of one tactical decision that at the time was, it, that Marmo Rama was portrayed as this brilliant tactician, the strategic implications of that ripple for the rest of the war. I mean, he learns a bit. He's better by Normandy, but, but, but you know, it's kind of too late by then. I mean, the whole, the whole charging into Egypt thing is, is just absolutely bonkers. Really. I think what we're talking about in modern France would be called operational reach. Your right. ability to, to project combat power over long distances. And it's interesting around the same time when as the Americans are building LSTs and, and those are in very high demand, there's this great quote from Churchill where he says, the fates of two empires rest on these goddamn things called LSTs. You know? <laughs> because again, the shipping piece, this ability to project combat power, yep. vast distances just isn't there with the Axis where the Allies are able to build those kinds of things. Yeah, but you can also say that a, a big blunder from the Allied point of view is that you know any future war, you know, you're going to have to cross an ocean other than, other than just defending our own territory. Sure, yeah. uh, and again, you know, smart thinkers should have kind of realized that, that at some point you're going to have to cross a sea um, in, in any future wars. And, and that's going to involve landing troops. And so you need landing craft, uh, uh, which are developed with uh, an unbelievable speed and brilliance and, and, and ingeniousness um, come the 1940s, but haven't really been thought about in 1939. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a blunder by Britain. It's a blunder by the United States, I would say. Absolutely. Probably need a, yeah. No, we need a. You ready? Uh, what we'd like to do at this point is uh, we got about uh, 25 minutes left. We'd like to open the floor for questions uh, of our distinguished guests. And with Jeremy, I'll let you take over. There's a, there's a lot of blunders we missed, so I'm sure you guys will yeah. fill us in. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for John Curatola, James Holland, and Conrad Crane. First question is going to be in the center aisle here in the back. Please stand. Morning, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, this round table kind of dovetails perfectly with uh, a book I recently finished, which was Omaha Beach, A Flawed Victory by Adrian Lewis. Yeah. And I'd uh, like book. to hear your thoughts <laughs> on the decisions and flaws by leadership with regards to the planning of that assault. Just on Omaha. Right. You focus on Omaha Beach. Yeah. You want to go ahead, Tom? Yes, just uh, take I, it. I, it's not one of my favorite books. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that the, he, there's a lot of hindsight in the book. Um, again, it, we're learning as we go. Uh, again, we talk about it, the number of amphibious assaults. The Army does a lot more amphibious assaults than the Marines do. Uh, but, and, but they have a much steeper learning curve in many ways, too. And yeah. a lot of the mistakes at Omaha are just you know, you, 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 a lot of it is the experience teaches you hard lessons, and there's a lot of that at Omaha. That's what I would say. Yeah. And if I dovetail off of what Khan just said, uh, the Mediterranean is an important classroom for the Americans and the British to learning with regard to amphibious assault. As late as 1940, the Army's not even interested in amphibiosity, and the Marine Corps is doing its thing in the 1930s looking for a job. Um, and what happens is that with the Mediterranean, the Army has to learn to work with the Navy. Who drives the, the, the boats? Who are the coxswains? And, and how do you do a beach party? And how do you establish a beachhead? These are things the Army has to learn. And Omaha Beach is, is kind of the, the crescendo that we see in the European theater. Um, so again, th there is a flawed uh, approach. But because the Army's happened to come to the game late and learn these lessons really quickly. Yeah, I, I would say that the flaws are pretty small, really. I, I mean, I think the D-Day plan is, is the best one available. And again, the constraint is shipping. You know, that, that, that's the biggest thing. You know, of course they would want to land more men. They've got all those men back in, back in the UK, got all those stores and tanks and everything. Um, there's no issue at all, overwhelming amount. Um, the problem is, is how do you deliver it in quick order to the beaches? Well, you know, that's, the, that's where shipping comes into it. I think all things considered, it's a I can't really see what else they could have done. I mean, I think the five beach decision was right. I think dropping in the airborne troops at the flanks was right. Um, having a vast armada of 7,000 vessels and, you know, 4,127 landing craft and 1,203 warships, you know, but that, <laughs> what more can you ask for? I mean, I mean, of course you can ask for more ship, yet more ships, but, but you know, they're down on numbers of, of LSTs and landing ships. Um, um, landing ships. They don't, they're, they're 33 short, which is a big, big number, and that's because of the huge demands of war, you know, a huge war going on in the Pacific, war going on in the Mediterranean, you know, the demands of war are just absolutely immense. Um, and, and yet, D-Day is pretty successful. Okay, so they don't 100% get to all their D-Day objectives, but you're always gonna give an objective which is beyond what is realistically achievable on day one, because you don't want to finally get there and then not have a plan B. But, but, but it's, it's a great, great you know, D-Day is an incredible success. And the bottom line is, is 
Omaha is, is costly, and I think it's 840 um, um, people, allied troops killed on, 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 on Omaha Beach, something like that, you know, which is a lot, but it's, it, it could have been a hell of a lot worse, and everyone's expecting it to be a lot worse. And, and it's a pretty successful operation. And, and you know, most of those, those strong points are, are, are reduced and um, in pretty quick order. Um, and yes, there's still fighting later on in the day, but, but it's, the battle is all over, really. I mean, it's, it's not, no longer a debate by what? 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, something like that. You know, I'd say that's a pretty successful mission. And the other four beaches are a lot better. I mean, it's, it, you look at, again, you look at, gotta look D-Day as a whole. Omaha has a lot of problems, but the other four beaches are much less problematic. And the Army does this in the short span of three years, which is a huge It's phenomenal. Feat. It's absolutely phenomenal. And, and, and this is the thing that everyone kind of, there is this sort of, in the kind of sort of popular narrative, there is this assumption that the U.S. just arrives in December 1941 in the war with this sort of fully formed kind of massive behemoth, and, and nothing could be kind of less than tr uh, um, less true. Where was it? 19 in the world in, in September 1939. 17th, I think. Yeah, yeah, between sort of Uruguay and Portugal or something. I mean, it's got, a, it's got an army of 189,000, which is gigantic compared to the, the British army of 2022, but is, is absolutely minuscule by 1939 standards. You know, it's, it's got nothing. It's got hardly any tanks. It's got hardly any, I think it's got 72 fighter planes or something like that. And they're kind of, you know, not particularly advanced types. You, you know, it's got a, it's, it's, it's just incredible, and yet, you know, you look at, 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 at the, I don't know, the, the port, the quayside of Bizerta, for example, in Tunisia in, in early July 1943, and you just see these rows of landing ships and rows of Shermans being rolled onto them, and you think, blimey, that's, that, that, is, that is exponential growth. And part, and part of the, 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 the thing about blunders is how do you learn from them? Right. And, and the Allies don't repeat many, Whereas we talk about the, the axis continues to make kind of the same mistakes throughout. And so that, that's a big deal. The, the Allies are a much better learning organization than the Axis. Uh, and the United States are just yeah. the best at learning lessons. I mean, it is incredible how quickly they take hits on the chin, learn from them, and improve. And, and you know, that's why the US armed forces are the best in the world, bar none, by, by kind of 1945. <laughs> Is it, is it? Well, the Next question is going to be to your left towards the front. Isn't it Churchill who says, though, the Americans always do the right thing yeah. after trying everything, everything else? else yeah. <laughs> Over here, gentlemen. Uh, great panel. Thank you very much. Um, so during the little, you, know, you guys have focused a lot on the sort of operational and strategic level, uh, but during the little break, I was talking with my uh, neighbor about more tactical level blunders. And he was arguing that the failure of the American army to bring M26 Pershing to Europe uh, was a blunder, which I actually don't think it is. The Sherman is, a, is one of the greatest tanks in World War II. But turning, yeah, yeah. Things, turning things around, what do you think of the um, idea of the focus of the Germans on heavy tanks and Tiger 1s and Tiger 2s as a huge mm. industrial and tactical blunder? Mm. Well, well they, they, they just can't compete industrially with the United States. They can't compete industrially with Britain, as, as it happens. So, you, you know, if you can't produce, or indeed the, U, the USSR, if you can't produce, you know, 85,000 tanks like the Soviets can with the T-34, for example, um, what do you do? Well, you go for quality over quantity. The, the problem, of course, is that with that quality comes greater complication. And maintaining them at the battlefront is very, very difficult. Um, and they don't help themselves by, by, of course, making them incredibly, incredibly complex. I, I mean, you know, anyone who knows how to drive a stick car can drive a Sherman tank. You get into it, it's the same configuration. Okay, you don't have a steering wheel, you've got, you've got sticks. But, but trust me, I've done it. It's really, really easy. And, 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 and you can't do the same with a Tiger tank. The Tiger tank is sort of like, like a, a, an 18-year-old new recruit getting into a Lamborghini Contact. And, and, and hoping they're not going to kind of grind the gears. You know, it's, it's just, they're too complex. I mean, uh, uh, the fabulous tank museum in Bobbington down in Dorset, which is really close to where I, where I live, you can see a cutaway of a Panther um, transmission, a gearbox, and it's just, it's mind-boggling. And, and when it does break down, you can't get at it. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas with a Sherman, you kind of do a few bolts at the front, pull it, you know, there it is, you pull it out, put another one in, you know, and you're good to go in two hours. And you can, you know, you can do that in the field. Uh, and the point about the Pershing is an interesting one, but, but we don't need that quality at that stage. What you need is lots. You need numbers. Uh, and you need, you know, you need to maintain the front and you need to be able to fit it into a Liberty ship, uh, into a compartment, because you don't have shipping containers in those days. You, you have, you, 
that they're, they're working out how to do boxing up, but you don't have containers. Uh, and so everything has to be shipped in an easy way, in a convenient way, and the Sherman fits that. Uh, and you've got lots of them. I mean, you know, 74,000 Sherman hulls and 49,000 Shermans, that, that counts for a lot when you think about the numbers of a, of a Tiger tank, which I think I'm right in saying is 1,347. Um, which is not very many, 492 King Tigers. That's not going to win you a war. Might win you a rather kind of la -di da fancy tactical engagement at Villa Bocage, but is it going to um, affect the outcome of the war? No. Next question in the center aisle to the back here. Having gone into Manchuria in 1931, the Japanese picked December 7th, so they have 10 years of war fighting experience. They attack on a Sunday when most of the personnel are not on the ships. They use two waves and do not bomb the fuel dumps nor the dry docks. Was it a blunder to not we wait talked about this last year. until later than December 7th and use three waves and kill a lot of Americans, sink ships, bomb the fuel docks, uh, bomb the fuel depot and the dry docks. Or did they choose two waves December 7th because of what was going on in Europe? and try to get the Americans to negotiate. We actually talked about that last year at the What If session, uh, and basically the, the panelists decided that bombing the dry docks wouldn't have made any difference and, uh, or the, the fuel dumps, but uh, it, that's, that's a Nagumo decision, though. I mean, they, had, they, had a, they were prepared to launch that other wave, and he made the decision not to launch the wave because he, he they hadn't taken out the American carriers. He didn't know where they were. So he, he leaves early because he's, he's, he, he's, they've had a tactical success destroying the ships, and he wanted to get away. But they actually had a plan to do that third wave, but he decided it was too risky and, and backed off. Next question is going to be your left, halfway back with Connie. You haven't mentioned Mark Clark. What do you think his place is I'll in this discussion? <laughs> but, but I, 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 all I heard was Mark Clark and then everyone laugh. I yeah. didn't hear the second bit. Yes, go ahead. Good. What is his place in this discussion? I'm a big fan of Mark Clark, and I, and I say that with a completely straight face. I, I think he's been much maligned. He was an absolutely brilliant planner. Um, he was responsible almost entirely for, you know, he was heading up the planning for, for Operation Torch. First time of uh, 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 amphibious operation of that scale had ever been mounted. Three different invasion forces, one coming from 3,000 miles, two coming from 1,000 miles, uh, and they all landed pretty much in the right place at the right time. I mean, that is, that is some achievement. Uh, he, he's a fearless commander, as he proved repeatedly, going into um, Vichy occupied North Africa ahead of the invasion, his actions on Salerno, he, he always fronted up to stuff. Um, uh, uh, one of his big criticisms is, is the Rapido. Um, you know, I don't really buy that because, you know, it's not an army commander's job on how, you know, you, I want you to get across that river. That's a reasonable order uh, in, in the circumstances of the time and what their allies are trying to achieve. You know, how you do it is, is up, to, up to the divisional commander and his subordinate commanders. Um, so I don't, I don't think he's particularly to blame for the Rapido. Um, the breakout from Rome and not going to Valmontoni is the biggest non-story ever, um, because the truth of the matter is, is, is in the pre-battle plan for Diadem, which is the, the uh, offensive that's launched on the 11th of May 1944 to take Rome, the breakout of Casino, the idea is that Eighth Army will push down the down um, Highway 6, the Via Casalina, which is on the kind of sort of right-hand side of the Liri Valley. And that the US II Corps and, and the French Expeditionary Corps on their left flank will move through the mountains at a lower pace. So the idea is that at a certain point, VI Corps, which is bottled up at, at Anzio, will break out and cut across to Highway 6 at this town called Valmontoni. And then 10th Army, German 10th Army, will be caught in this pocket by 8th Army meeting, pushing forward and, and coming into the bit on the kind of left-hand flank where 
two core and, and the FEC are, are kind of following up behind. But what actually happens is the, the French and the Americans on the flanks of 8th Army do much, much better. And so 10th, 10th, German 10th Army, when it retreats, doesn't retreat at all down the Highway 6. Not a single soldier escapes from the front down that road. They're pushing much further kind of um, eastwards um, in, into the mountains. So going to Valmontoni is not going to stop you. On the other hand, as 6th Corps is driving out of the Anzio bridgehead, they're going across the flanks of the entire German 14th Army. And so what Clark does instead is he turns and puts most of his troops towards dealing with that and utterly destroys 14th Army. So in the pre-battle um, plan, the aim is to destroy 10th Army. What actually happens is they badly maul 10th Army and destroy 14th Army, which isn't in the battle plan at all. And I would say that's a pretty good result. Uh, and that is Mark Clark's decision. And the other thing is, is that there's been this kind of, this historiography of um, Alexander, who was the Army Group commander, being absolutely furious, he'd never, incandescent with rage, uh, that when Mark Clark didn't go all out for Valmontoni. That is just absolute nonsense. There is nothing in any of the diaries at all at the time to suggest that was the case. And Alexander was, was famously imperturbable uh, and phlegmatic about everything and tended not to lose his temper. In fact, the only time he's ever known to have lost his temper was in 1917, um, where, when one of his soldiers refused to give a drink of water to a wounded German prisoner. Um, uh, but otherwise, he was famous for, for keeping his cool. And it turns out that it all comes down to a, co a quote in a Raleigh Trevelyan book, who was a junior, um, who was a subaltern, a, a second lieutenant at Anzio, uh, part of a uh, British lieutenant, but, but part of, of the US Sixth Corps. And he interviewed Harold Macmillan, who was the British minister in um, Italy at the time, and uh, was a great pal of, of Alexander's. And he interviewed him in the 60s. And, and it was Macmillan who said that, um, Alex was furious when, when Mark Clark didn't go all out to Valmontoni. But the weird thing is, is Rani Trevelyan never cited that quotation. So I rang him up and I said, Mr. Trevelyan, you know, just got this question about Harold Macmillan, you know, you, you never cited it. He went, gosh, did I not? I can't think why. I said, well, when, when was that interview? He couldn't remember at all. Now, to be fair, it was in the 1960s and that was quite a long time ago. But all I can tell you is no mention of Alexander losing his temp temper at all in Macmillan's diaries, which were written at the time. And even Lease, who hated Mark Clark's guts, they just didn't, they just did not see eye to eye. They were kind of total chalk and cheese. Says, I have to say, the Americans have done absolutely brilliantly. You know, Mark Clark's done fantastically. Well done, Fifth Army. You know, so, and then, when Alexander gets bumped up and becomes Supreme Allied Commander in the Mediterranean, he has to choose a new Army Group Commander. And there is no pressure in Italy at all to choose an American. He could have chosen Dick McCreary, who's the um, 8th Army commander. He doesn't. He chooses Mark Clark. And why does he choose Mark Clark? Because Mark Clark's really good. So I'm a big fan. Yep. <laughs> for, a, for, a, for a competing view, read Rick Atkins' book, Day of Battle. He has a very much more negative view of Clark. And, and Clark's, Clark, in some ways, is his own worst enemy. Some of his personality rankled people, and especially later on, it, it leads to some acerbic. Yeah, 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 but, okay, and, this is, and I'm going to say this on a number of points. There's a lot of people that don't like generals and, and criticize them, historians who criticize them. You know, Monty is one, uh, um, Patton is another. You know, there's lots of people like that, who, and the reason people criticize them is because they don't like their characters. But I would argue that being an arrogant, um, vain, um, slightly narcissistic character doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a bad battlefield commander. And I think a lot of time historians have conflated their personal dislike of the character with their abilities as a general. The two things are not necessarily uh, go hand in hand. Yeah, I, I have never met a humble general. <laughs> Alexander. We're going to go I never towards, met him. No, I never no, no. Met him. towards your right here in the front. <laughs> yes, you can say that about historians too. Definitely. I'd like to uh, have you address uh, the training of the individual soldiers. It seems that time again, uh, the American Army, especially our leader units, are trained that if the leadership is gone, you have to take over. And I wonder if that was true in the Axis powers or whether they were stymied by that chain of command. Well, <laughs> training is not a constant in the Second World War. Um, so, so training of elite, uh, of, of the primary divisions, and we're talking about the army here, let's just talk about the army for, 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 that, for this particular question. In the German army is really good in the 1930s. 
But only 33% of the troops in 1940, German troops in 1940, are in the kind of top echelon of, of, of training. So, so lots of the, the other, whatever that is, 57% are not fully trained at that point, even though they're going into war. So again, there's not, there's not a consistency about training, and training changes as the war progresses. So, you know, your, your Fallschirmjäger, your paratrooper of 1940 is supremely well-trained and highly motivated. He's a volunteer, he wants to be there. You know, he's, 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 he's gung-ho. And, and if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're motivated, you're more likely to use your initiative because you're motivated to do so. If you're just a conscript, all you want to do is keep your head, head, head down and kind of, I just want to be led. Just tell me what to do and I'll sort of do it. Um, but you don't really want to be there. By the end of the war, you know, you've got Fallschirmjäger who are, you know, got six weeks of training, they've done a couple of jumps, they're kind of kicked off to Brittany, you know, training continues on the job, you know, and what, what training do they do? You know, clearing mines, laying mines, doing route marches, that kind of stuff, putting on beach obstacles, and they're not particularly well trained at all. Um, and so so it, it, it really, really depends. I mean, what you do find is that most troops, of allied troops, for example, landing on Normandy have had at least two years training. You know, that's pretty, pretty good. But you've got a fundamental problem. Your fundamental problem is that the vast majority of people don't want to be there. Um, and, and certainly from the point of view of British and, and Canadian and American troops, for example, you know, they're conscripts from democracies and, you know, they're not going to be shot if they run away. Uh, um, so, you know, it's, it's how you motivate them is, is very difficult. And Americans motivate them by making sure they have regular post and, and Hershey bars and, and Coca-Cola and, you know, ice cream on ships and all that kind of stuff and, and, and making sure that they're you know, not too much is expected of them. Um, and a lot is expected of them. By today's standards, it's a, it's, it's a fearsome amount. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very hard to kind of generalize about training because training is, as I say, it is, it's just not a, it's not a constant at all. And you know, you look at the, because of those 10 years that the gentleman at the back was talking about that the Japanese have had beforehand, you know, they're fighter pilots at the start of the war when, the, when, you know, when they enter the war in the end of 1941. They're absolutely unbelievable. You know, they've got sort of 700 hours in their logbooks. They're supremely well trained. They're highly motivated. You know, they're absolutely a, a core delete. Uh, um, but by 1944, they're absolutely rubbish. You know, one of the reasons why my um, Mitch's mob kind of makes such a, um, a mess of uh, Azawa's um, aircraft uh, on the 19th and 20th of. of June 1944 is because they're undertrained, yep. you know, and it's exactly the same with with the Luftwaffe by 1944. You know, you've got you've got pilots coming in who've got 90 hours on their logbook against people who've got 350. You know, it's a, it's you know, and when and when your new fighter pilot comes and joins his Mustang group in March 1944, he's got 350 hours in his logbook. He's then kind of given a kind of you know a bit of a a, a week or two to acclimatize, get used to kind of his air base at Boxstead in Suffolk in England. Um, he's taken up by the old hands, taught some tricks so that, you know, his pilot skills are augmented by tactical nous and knowledge and experience. Then he's sent on a kind of, you know, a couple of milk runs. Uh, and only then is he kind of finally unleashed a kind of, you know, on a trip to Berlin or something. So his preparation is just superb. Whereas because of the shortage of fuel and shortage of absolutely everything, your 90 hour Luftwaffe fighter pilot arrives at the front, he's absolutely bewildered, he hasn't got, he can barely take off in his 109, he gets taken off, he gets shot down immediately and that just lambs to a slaughter. So it's just... Um, and I think to yeah. that point, when you look at the, the production rates of German fighters in 1944, they go through the roof, but you don't have pilots to put in the airplanes, you no, know? Exactly and so you right. gotta well, have both things. A couple things on that. Number one is the a book I recommend everybody, it's a book by Robert Rush called Hell and Hurt and Forest, where he has a great comparison of German and American replacement systems. And he talks a bit about how this training fits and the superiority of the American individual replacement system over the German replacement system. But on the fighter pilot thing, the deadliest job in World War II is being a German fighter pilot. 90% are killed or maimed for life. You don't fly 25 missions and go home, you fly till you get killed. Uh, but the one decision that I, the, one of the blunders I often wonder is, it, Hitler makes a decision to turn the ME-262 into a bomber mm -hmm. that delays the fielding of the ME-262 for a year. It's one of those great what ifs. What happens if ME-262 show up a year earlier? What does that do to the air mm -hmm. war? I mean, that's one of those decisions, that's a great what if thing, but I mean, that's a massive blunder by Hitler at, on a production level that I think has massive strategic effects down the road, kind of like the, some of the tank stuff as well. Next question in the back to your right. Uh, going back to Italy, was it a blunder by General Lucas not to go on to Rome instead of consolidating at Anzio? 
Mm. Oh, that old chestnut. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's so hard to answer that one because the truth is the whole Italian campaign is blighted by insufficient shipping. <laughs> and, and also by the prioritization of the um, US 15 strategic air force. And, and the truth is, I think that Anjo just doesn't have enough. So I, I think he probably wasn't, uh, I think he was probably right, but I also think it was right that he left when he left because I think he'd kind of, he'd lost his way a little bit and, and, and I think he was a bit too ponderous and, and it needed fresh blood. And I, and I think the decision to remove him from post was the right one at the time. You know, these are really, really tough decisions. It's not that he did anything particularly wrong, it's just that he suddenly wasn't the right man in position anymore. And, and that's a gut instinct which, which Alexander went for and, and which Clark concurred with. And I think it was the right call. But he couldn't have gone to Rome. It, it, he, he, he would have outstretched his, he'd have reached his own uh, um, culmination point in very quick order, I think. Yeah, so. a, a bigger question would be, should we have gone to Italy at all? I mean, once, once yeah. they took the, 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 the southern boot and had the airfields at Foggia, what, what good was the rest of the, you know, should, should Anzio even really have happened? I mean, that's another question about, you know, there was always that fear that, you know, Marshall had the fear that we got sucked in the Mediterranean, we'd get involved in these peripheral campaigns, which we did. I mean, with Marshall's fear in, in 1942, valid ones? I mean, that's one of those, it was, was the Italian campaign well, worth well, well, yeah, you know, the, the, the huge strain on the Allied war effort is, is absolutely enormous. And yet, you know, as, as you point out, you know, the, getting those airfields at Foggia, um, you know, I was there just a few weeks ago, and, and it's amazing. You know, it's, it's, you, you literally couldn't find a more obvious kind of bomber-friendly area than, than that, that weird sort of flat plain mm -hmm. around Foggia. It's extraordinary. And... It absolutely drew German troops away. It absolutely forced them to kind of re you know, replace the Italians in, in, in the Aegean and the Balkans and, and, and Greece. You know, so that's, that's a big tick. It's quite hard maintaining a front if you're permanently on the defensive. Um, but again, they just, they just don't have quite enough of everything. You, you know, and the Americans agree to a, a Germany first policy, but it's a, but it's a Pacific only just a narrow inch behind coming second um, and you know in terms of shipping there's a lot of times where actually it's it's that's the primary theater not the secondary theater so you, you know there's a there's an awful lot going on and and I, I, I feel for all those guys in in Italy I really do I think they were given a really really impossible task ladies and gentlemen John Curatola James Holland and Tom Crane thank you gentlemen that was a true pleasure Thanks for